So in this video, we're going to be designing an email automation platform such as Klaviyo or MailChimp. So at a high level, an email automation platform is something that allows customers to sign up and track data and allows companies to create automations that send emails to those customers. So our email automation is going to take in all the data from these customers and uses that data to send emails out over the internet. So there's a lot of really interesting moving pieces when we're designing this system. But before we dive into that, let's first take a look at some requirements for this system. So the first thing our system needs to do is actually track information about our email profiles and be able to log events associated with those profiles. So those events could be things like somebody visited the website or signed up. The customers of our email platform should be able to add those profiles to lists. So this would allow our customers to organize their email profiles and send specific messaging to different customer segments. Once we have all this data tracked, our company should be able to schedule campaigns, which are just bulk emails sent to a list of profiles. And they should be able to schedule those campaigns for some date in the future so that they can plan ahead and send emails at optimal times. And we also want our customers to be able to create flows, which are sequences of tasks that are run when some event is tracked. So for example, we could have a flow that says that when our user signs up for our website, that's logged as an event, and then that triggers a flow that sends them an email, waits five days, and then sends a follow-up message. In reality, a lot of email automation platforms will include a lot more functionality other than just sending emails and waiting. But for the purposes of this system, we're going to assume that our flows only can do those two things. And then finally, we want to be able to log any emails that were sent from our system so that we have a trail of what we've been sending to our customers, as well as deliverability metrics that show whether or not those emails have bounced due to invalid email addresses or other problems. In terms of non-functional requirements, we want our flows and campaigns to run on time. So this is where a lot of the complexity involved in creating this system comes from, is actually scheduling these flows and campaigns to make sure that they can run at specific times. We want our system to be fault tolerant as well. So for example, if a flow fails in the middle, we want to be able to retry and continue where we left off instead of starting from the beginning of the flow or losing all of our progress. In terms of load here, we're going to have 100,000 customers, which are the actual companies that are using our email automation platform. And each of those customers is going to be tracking 50,000 email profiles. Every profile for every customer is going to trigger five events per week. And then one of those events is going to trigger a flow that will actually send emails to them. In addition to that flow, every customer is also going to run one campaign every week, which is just going to be a bulk email sent out to all of their customers. All right, so now that we understand the requirements, let's take a look at a high level overview of this system. So in order to track information about our email profiles and all of the events associated with them, we're going to need some sort of public API that those people can access directly. This API would be used on our company's websites so that when users perform specific actions, they'd be logged in our system. In addition to this public API, we also need a private API that our companies can access and use to set up their flows and campaigns and lists. This API will also be used to monitor any metrics that they have or see specific information about certain profiles. Now, because both of these APIs are accessing data, we're going to need some sort of database to store that information in. So this database is going to be holding things like campaigns and flows, as well as the profiles and events and lists. Once we have all this data stored, we need two more services that actually do the emailing, and that's going to be our flow execution and our campaign scheduling services. So our flow execution system is going to be responsible for responding to events that are being sent and actually executing that sequence of tasks. And then our campaign scheduling system is going to be responsible for sending a bulk email at a specific time. So remember, every campaign is going to have a date that it's scheduled for and a list list of emails that it's supposed to be sent to, and a flow is going to be triggered by an event, so that's something that's being sent to our public API, and we'll then execute a sequence of events such as sending an email or waiting. It's also important to remember that our flows are scoped to one user that has triggered the event, while our campaign is scoped to an entire list of emails. So the final system here is our actual email service, and this is going to be what's taking in emails from our flows and campaigns and actually sending them out over the internet. Okay, so now that we understand the high-level overview of the system, let's dive into each of these pieces, starting with the public API. So remember, our public API is what our end users are using to track events and information that's associated with them. So this needs to be publicly accessible from our users' web browsers so that they can log this data as they're going through our customer's website. We can actually make this API very simple. All we need is one post request that we can use to log an event. And as we're logging that event, we can also include any updates to profile data that's associated with that email. So let's take a look at the things we're going to include in this post request, right? We need the email of the user because that's our identifier for them. We need the name of the event that we're logging. And we also need any data that we have about that event. So if we think about how our events are going to be structured, every event is going to be associated with a particular email address. It's going to have a specific name and we're going to allow our customers to add any other data that they want to that event. This will allow them to 
to effectively track data within our system and build flows that are conditional based on those event data. Finally, we're also going to include profile data in this request. And if that field is included, we can use this to update any information that we have about the profile. The data that we're including here will be useful to allow companies to access specific information that we're including about a profile that isn't specific to one particular event. So even though this API is public, we still want some form of authentication so that we can determine what company this user is associated with. Emails are not unique within our system because multiple companies can be tracking the same email address, but they'll want to have different data and events associated with it that are specific to their business. So we'll want to have some sort of public API key that is scoped to a specific company and will allow our API to know which company is making the requests. So now that we understand what our API call is doing, let's do a little bit of math. We can recall from our requirements that we have 100,000 customers and each customer is tracking 50,000 profiles and each profile is submitting five events per week to our API. If we multiply all of those together, we get 25 billion events being tracked every week, which corresponds to 41,000 events being tracked every single second. If we only had a single API server, it certainly wouldn't be able to handle that much load. So we're going to need to scale horizontally. This will allow us to handle this huge throughput of traffic, and it'll also allow us to handle bursts of activity during certain peak times. When we're scaling our API horizontally, all that means is we're going to introduce multiple servers that are all running the same API. However, our users need to know which API to actually access, so we're going to put a load balancer in front of all of these API servers, and our users will make Make their request to the load balancer, which will then direct them to whichever API node is available to handle that request. Another advantage of this load balancer is fault tolerance. So if one of these API nodes fails, our load balancer can simply direct our users to other nodes that are available. Okay, so at this point, we have an API that can scale to meet our needs, and we've determined the structure for how we're going to interact with this API. All this API is actually doing behind the scenes is just writing data, right? It's taking in events from our users, and it needs to put them somewhere. So we're going to have to introduce a database that our API can write to. So for now, our database needs to track two main pieces of data, and that's events and profiles. So our profiles are going to consist of an email address and then some properties that we have that we've set for that user. And we're also going to include a customer ID so that we know which company this user is owned by. Remember that emails are not unique within this system. They're scoped to a specific customer. We're also going to include a unique ID for this profile so that we can uniquely identify this record. It's worth noting that we could also uniquely identify this record by the combination of email address and customer ID. Combining those two fields together would result in a unique identifier. For events, we're going to be tracking all of the things that we included in our API call, which is the email address, name of the event, and any properties that we have for that event. And then on the back end, we're also going to include the timestamp that that event occurred, as well as the customer ID so we know which company that event is for. Again, we're also going to include a unique ID for this event so that we can identify this particular record. Doing the math, if we have 100,000 customers and each customer has 50,000 profiles, we can assume that each profile is around one kilobyte of data, that means we have five terabytes of profile data in our database. Events for those profiles are being constantly added to our database, but if we assume that each profile has about 2,600 events on average, and each event is also about one kilobyte, that's going to be 13 petabytes of event data. And finally, if we look at each profile producing five events every week, that's going to be 25 billion writes to our database every single week, which corresponds to 41,000 writes to our database every second. So this is clearly way too much data and way too much load for one single database node to handle. So we're going to need to horizontally scale our database and shard it so that our writes and our data is distributed across those nodes. So what this means in essence is that instead of having just one database node, we have multiple database nodes and each one of those is holding a subset of the data and is responsible for handling a subset of the writes to our database. Whenever we're sharding a database, we have to think about the shard key that we're going to use as this is critical to querying our database and distributing our data effectively. Whenever we read data from our database, we need to go out to every single database node that could hold the data that we're looking for. So we want to come up with a shard key that won't require us to reach out to every single database node for every read. For example, if we sharded on email address and we were looking for data about a list of emails, we'd have to go out to every single database node because all of those email addresses would be scattered across all of these nodes. This would be pretty inefficient and we can do better for this system. A better choice for shard key in this situation would be customer ID. We're never looking at data across multiple customers, so every customer will have all of their data stored on one node. An easy way to think about this would be to imagine that we have one dedicated database for every single customer. We can easily see how this would improve our performance because that node would only be handling data for one customer instead of handling the data for 100,000 customers. In reality, we can use hashing to make it so that multiple customers are stored on one database node, and we don't have to have 100,000 nodes to support 100,000.
100,000 customers. This will allow us to scale up and down the number of database nodes that we have, irrespective of the number of customers we're tracking. Something that's worth noting about customer ID is that some customers will be tracking a lot more information than other customers. So a very large company will likely have more email profiles than a very small company. If we had a relatively small number of customers in comparison to the number of database nodes, this could be a problem because it would mean that one database node would be having a lot more load than another one. However, because we have so many customers, right, we have 100,000 customers and we don't have anywhere near that many database nodes, if we distribute all of our customers randomly across all of our databases, it's statistically likely that there'll be a similar number of large and small customers on each database node. This is referred to as the shard key having a high cardinality, meaning that there's many customer ID values. High cardinality is an important characteristic to look for when choosing a shard key. So now that we have an effective and scalable way to store all of our profiles and events, let's take a look at our private API and see how we can allow our users to set up campaigns and flows to automate messaging to those profiles. So for our private API, which again is what our companies that are signed up for our email platform are going to be using, we're going to have a number of requests that we can make. All of this is being driven by our functional requirements that we talked about early on in the video. And we'll remember one thing from our functional requirements is that we want to have lists of profiles. We want to be able to read and write from those lists. So in order to write to those lists, we're going to have a request that includes a list ID and allows us to post an email address that will be added to that list. And in order to read from the list, we're just going to make a git request to that same list with the same ID and we'll get a list of members and their email addresses. We also want our customers to be able to create campaigns. So to create a campaign, they'll make a post request that includes some of this data, including the lists that our campaign is being sent to, the name of the campaign, the date that that campaign should be scheduled for, and the subject and body of the email that will be sent at that date. So once the customer makes this post request, they can expect that an email with this subject and body will be sent at this date to this list of email addresses. So we'll talk more about the systems involved in actually making that happen a bit later. We also want to be able to create flows. So when our customer creates a flow, they'll include a name for that flow, a trigger, which corresponds to the name of the event that should trigger that flow and a list of tasks. And those tasks are going to consist of an email that's being sent and a number of hours that we should delay before sending that email. A real email automation system would have a lot more complex of a structure for these tasks, but because our system is only sending emails and waiting, we can have this very simple structure that makes it easy to understand. So once the customer makes this post request, they can expect that whenever this particular event name occurs, the email address that triggered that event will be sent these emails in these specific time intervals. Finally, through our API, we want our customers to be able to track the metrics associated with the events that we're logging and see information about the specific email profiles that we're tracking. So for profiles, they should be able to include an email address. And they should be able to get out any properties that we've stored for that profile, along with a list of events, including the timestamp for that event, the name of the event, and the properties that we included in it. This list of events should also include emails being sent and delivered so that our customers can track those things as well. Finally, we want customers to be able to track metrics for a particular event. So if they include an event name, they should be able to get a list of email addresses and the number of times that metric has occurred for that particular email address. Doing the math here, if we assume that each customer is making about 10 requests every day to manage their emails and track metrics, that only corresponds to a million requests per day or 12 requests every second. One API node probably could handle this much load, but we'll still introduce a load balancer just like we saw for our public API because this will give us fault tolerance and will allow us to handle spikes in load. So we probably only need to have two or three API nodes, but introducing this load balancer will still make sure that our system remains online and that even if there's a large peak in load, we can handle that. Now that we've introduced all these new API routes, we have a lot more data that our API needs to store. So let's take a look at our new data model. Our profiles and events here haven't changed. These are the same as we went over for our public API. The first thing we're introducing here is lists. A list is going to have a unique identifier associated with it. It's going to have a name for the list, and it's going to include a list of emails inside of it. And again, we're including a customer ID so we know which customer this list is for. If we were dealing with a relational database here, we could also create a separate table for which each record would include the name of a list and one email address that is a member of that list. However, based on the requirements of our system at this point, we're only ever querying the entire list at once, and that's to send a campaign. So there's no real need for this added complexity, and we can simply use an array field to store all of the email addresses at once. If we were dealing with different requirements, this could certainly change, and it might be worthwhile to create a separate table for list members. Once we have our list, we can create campaigns. And this campaign is going to include all of the information that we sent in the API, including the name of the campaign, the date it should be scheduled, and the subject and body of the email. And it will include an array of list IDs that will be all of the lists that 
that campaign is going to be sent to. And finally, we have our flows, which include, again, a name, a trigger, which corresponds to an event ID that will trigger that flow, and a list of tasks. This data model could be done either in a relational database or in a NoSQL database. Because we're dealing with such a large scale and we need to introduce sharding, a NoSQL database will likely be easier to set up, but it's certainly possible to use either technology. It's mostly a matter of developer preference. If we were using a relational database, we could certainly make this data model a lot more complex by, for example, separating out emails from our lists or separating out tasks from our flows and introducing more tables to handle those data structures. However, with a NoSQL database, we'll likely be better off including these as arrays inside the document so that we can easily query all of that data at once. Doing the math here, if we have 100,000 customers and each customer has 10 flows, that's only five gigabytes of data. And if we assume that they've sent 100 campaigns over time and each campaign is about one kilobyte, that's only 10 gigabytes of data. And finally, if each customer has one megabyte worth of lists, that would only be 100 gigabytes. This quantity of data could absolutely be stored on a single database node, so we don't necessarily have to worry about sharding here. However, because we have this really easy shard key on customer ID, and we're already introducing sharding for some of our other data structures, such as events and profiles, we might as well do sharding here as well, and that'll allow us to scale up even if the number of customers increases over time. In most systems, sharding comes with a lot of trade-offs, but because customer ID works so well as a shard key for this particular system, it's okay to introduce sharding even if it's not immediately necessary. So now that we've figured out our schema for our APIs and our database, we can now start to get to the fun parts of this system, which is dealing with flow execution and scheduling campaigns. So let's start off with campaigns. A bare bones campaign scheduler is very simple. All it has to do is go out to our database, find the next campaign that needs to be scheduled, wait until it's time to run that campaign, and then send all of the emails for that campaign to the email service, and then mark the campaign as completed in the database. To find the next campaign to be scheduled, we'd be doing a query that filters for the smallest timestamp that isn't already marked as completed. We'd want to have this entire process be done in a transaction for our database. And this means that we won't have any concurrency issues that result in executing the same campaign twice. Our database will automatically make sure that this process is executed sequentially, even if we have multiple campaign schedulers running. Doing the math here, if we recall that we have 100,000 customers that are each doing one campaign every week, we only have to process 10 campaigns every minute. However, every single campaign is going to consist of 50,000 profiles, so that results in 8,000 emails being sent every second. So because we only have 10 campaigns running every minute, there's no need for us to scale up our campaign schedule or beyond a single node. However, every time we read a campaign, we're going to be querying our database to find the next one to be executed. And because our database contains a huge amount of data, we want to make sure that that process actually happens efficiently, so we're going to need to make sure our database is indexed on the date for the campaign. This will make sure that we don't have to scan through all the data in our database to actually find that campaign. Additionally, recall that each campaign contains 50,000 profiles, so we're going to have 8,000 emails that are actually being sent out every second. Since it might take some time to queue all of these emails, and because there could be a failure that happens with one of them, we might want to decouple the scheduling of the campaign from the actual execution of those emails. So to do this, we can introduce a queue that'll allow these two processes to communicate asynchronously. So the campaign scheduler's job is now going to be to go out to the database and find the next campaign to be scheduled, add it to a queue, and then the campaign campaign execution service is going to be responsible for pulling from that queue, finding the list of email addresses that that campaign should be sent to, and then actually queuing those emails with the email service. We can scale this campaign execution service as much as we want by simply having multiple workers that are all reading from this queue. But decoupling these two services means that our campaign scheduler can easily sit on a single node and is only responsible for doing a very small task 10 times every minute. Because we're dealing with a relatively small amount of load here, it's very nice that we can use such a simple solution instead of having to resort to more complex systems. For our flow execution service, things get a little bit more complicated. If we're taking a look at a very basic flow execution service, all it would do is be triggered by an event. And then when an event happens, it would find any flows that would be triggered by that event from our database. And if there is one, it would loop through all the tasks in that flow and then send emails to the email service for each one, including delaying between each of those emails. Taking a look at the system end to end, we need some way for this flow execution service to be triggered when an event occurs. So to do this, we're going to introduce a queue. And whenever our public API 
logs an event, it'll, in addition to adding that event to the database, also add it to a queue, and that queue will trigger the flow execution service, which can then go out and find any flows that would be triggered by that event. Doing the math here, if we have five events happening every week for each profile, that corresponds to 41,000 events happening every second. So that's what our queue and our flow execution service need to handle. Only one of those five events is going to actually trigger a flow, so we have 8,000 flows being sent every second. We can horizontally scale our queue to handle 41,000 events per second easily, and we can also horizontally scale our flow execution service to handle that amount of load simply by adding more replicas of this service on other machines. Every single time our flow execution service is triggered, it's going to have to read the database to find flows that are triggered by that event. So our database actually needs to be able to handle 41,000 reads every second. So in order to do this, we're going to make sure that we index on trigger for our flows table. And this will make sure that we have the data available to efficiently find any flows that were triggered by that event. Additionally, we might also want to add some read replicas to our database. And those are just going to be copies of the database with the same data that we can read from that'll help to distribute the read load across multiple machines. So we have one final problem here, and that's that even though we have 8,000 flows every second, each flow could take hours or even days to execute fully. Recall that our flows contain delays between different emails. So for example, sending an email and then waiting five days before sending a follow-up. We could theoretically achieve this load even when we're running flows sequentially, but we'd have to scale out to millions of workers and all of these workers would simply be waiting instead of actually doing any work. So let's come up with a better solution. The crux of the problem is that we don't want our flows to run sequentially. Just like our campaign service, we need some way to find the next task within a flow that should be executed across all of the flows that are running. So in order to do this, we're going to introduce a flow task database, which contains every task for every flow that's scheduled to be executed, along with the time that that task should be run. Our flow execution service, instead of actually executing the flow, can be responsible for simply adding the tasks into our task database. Once we have that, we can do something very similar to our campaign system, where we're simply finding the next task to execute from this database, waiting until it's start time, and then sending emails to the email service, and then either removing the task from the database entirely or marking it as completed. With 8,000 flows per second, we want to make sure that our flow task database can handle all of this throughput and that our task execution service can process all of this effectively. So a first step would be to index this database on the time that the task should be executed, and this will make sure that our database read operation can occur quickly. However, even with that optimization, 8,000 flows per second will be pretty difficult to run on a single task execution service. So we need some way to scale this system. However, simply adding more nodes here won't help because if we have multiple nodes that are all trying to find the next task to be executed, all of those nodes are going to receive the same task, and that task will get run multiple times. The only way to solve this problem is to sacrifice our strict ordering, so our task execution service, instead of finding the very next task that should be executed across all of the data, will instead be finding the next task to be executed within a subset of the data. So what this will look like is we'll have all writes and reads from our flow task database distributed randomly across a number of nodes. So whenever our flow execution service adds our tasks to our database, it'll add each task to one of these nodes at random. And every time our task execution service wants to find the next task, it'll find that task within one of these nodes at random. This means we can scale up our task execution service to as many database nodes as we have, and they won't interfere with each other because they're all looking at different database nodes. We'll still want to ensure that all of the processing done on this task execution service is happening in a transaction, and that'll make sure that multiple services that are querying the same piece of data will be executed sequentially instead of them both executing the same task. This process of reading and writing randomly is a bit odd and difficult to reason about, but it does mean that our database will be able to handle all of the load for reading and writing, and it'll mean that our task execution service can scale without resulting in concurrency problems. So let's take a look at this whole system end to end again. Whenever our public API receives an event, it'll log that event to the database and add it into this queue. Our flow execution service will pull from this queue, find any flows that are triggered by that event, and then add all of that flow's tasks to this flow task database. The flow execution service will be responsible for looking at the delays between those tasks and determining the time that they should be run. Every task that our flow execution service adds to this database will be added to one of n nodes at random. At the same time, our task execution service will be querying this database. So we'll go out to one of these n nodes at random 
and find the next task within that node that should be executed. It'll then wait until it's time to run that task and then send an email to the email service to complete it. So this system is a bit complex and a bit unusual, but it does succeed in meeting the scale of our service. So now that we've done flow execution and campaign scheduling, the last piece of this system is the email service that'll actually send emails out over the internet. So to understand how this is gonna work, let's take a look at how emails are sent between servers. So let's say we have two people. We have A at gmail.com and B at iCloud.com. If A wants to send an email to B, they're going to send that email to their own server, gmail.com, over SMTP. SMTP is a protocol that's specifically designed for sending mail, and that's what A is going to use to communicate with their email server. Once gmail.com sees that email and notices that it's destined for iCloud.com, it's going to have to send that email off to iCloud so that B can actually access it. This process also uses SMTP. Finally, once iCloud has this email, B can use IMAP or POP to actually fetch the email from that server. So SMTP is the protocol for sending emails, either from a client to their email server or between two email servers. And then IMAP and POP are both different protocols that you can use for downloading emails from your email server. So because our system is going to be sending emails to an email server, it's going to use SMTP, and it'll be responsible for connecting to and sending an SMTP request to the email address associated with our users. So a barebone system is going to look like this, right? We're just going to have a single server that's taking in requests. And when it gets a request, it's going to send an SMTP request out to whichever server the email is destined for. We also want to log that that email was sent. So we're going to send that data back to our database, logging that the email was sent and whether or not it was delivered. Now, because we're sending such a huge quantity of emails, we have to introduce a little bit more complexity. The first thing we need to do here is introduce a queue. And this is going to allow us to do two things. The first thing it'll allow us to do is scale our email service so we can have multiple copies of this email service that are all pulling from the queue and sending emails out. This will allow us to handle the scale at which we're sending emails. The other thing that this queue will do is allow the service to run asynchronously. So all of our flow execution and campaign execution services aren't going to want to have to wait for the email to be actually sent. So for example, if the destination server is down for some reason, it might take a long time for that email to actually get sent out. We don't want this to slow down other parts of our system. We'd rather just have those messages wait in a queue and our email service can send those out whenever they're ready. Another interesting issue that we'll run into when we're sending emails at scale is being blocked by the destination email servers. This isn't necessarily a problem with our system, but it does mean that we're going to have to work with the larger email providers like Google, Apple, and Microsoft, and make sure that the IP addresses of our service are whitelisted so that our customers can send out as much mail as they want. We also have to make sure that our email service conforms to various security protocols such as Domain Key Identified Mail, or DKIM, and this will also help to ensure that our system isn't blocked by spam detection. All right, so now let's take a look at this entire system as a whole. We have our private API API and our public API. And these are both writing data out to our database. We have our campaign scheduling system that'll read from this database and send campaigns out to our email service. And we have our flow execution service, which will be triggered by events from our public API. and will also be responsible for sending emails to our email service. Emails will wait in a queue before they're sent and our email service will be responsible for using SMTP to actually send those emails out. So this ended up being a very complex system for a pretty simple business problem. So it's really interesting to think about how complex these systems can get when they have to handle such a large amount of load. In terms of next steps, there's also a lot to think about because this service could certainly have a lot more functionality than just the basics that we covered in this video. So it could certainly be a good exercise to go through adding different functionalities to this system and thinking through how those systems would be designed. If you enjoyed this video, you can find more content like this on interviewpen.com. We have tons of more in-depth system design and data structures and algorithms content for any skill level, along with a full coding environment and an AI teaching assistant. You can also join our Discord where we're always available to answer any questions you might have. If you or a friend wants to master the fundamentals of software engineering, check us out at interviewpen.com.